Hi, it's Steve from ECSFR. Truth is our gift to you. Knowledge is power, and this four-part expose will empower you to take action. As we walk you through, the four parts being part one, conclusive proof of harm from 5G. The 5G parliamentary inquiry in Australia and the need for precaution. Part three, misleading and deceptive conduct. And part four, a bit more of unpacking a panza, the illusion of jurisdiction and government failure. Now we're not doctors or lawyers and make this four part presentation in good faith and without prejudice. We must warn you, our expose is for education and action, for you to take action, not entertainment. So I'll try to not be as boring as I can. This is not fake news or disinformation. This is our reality. We share with you our references and logic so you, your elected officials, your lawyers, your doctors may independently confirm what we're presenting. Thank you. Part one, proof of harm from 5G. Remember the age old adage, anything in moderation. Too much of a good thing will kill you. This is true for many of our foods, beverages and medicines. A small dose of poison is often therapeutic and healing. A large dose, fatal. It's for this reason we have laws around exposure or dosage of poisons. Let's consider alcohol. One glass of red wine a night has been said to be therapeutic. After several glasses, your blood pressure increases and negative effects start to be experienced. After several bottles, you may end up in hospital or deceased. Now consider the state liquor licensing laws around exposure to alcohol and adverse health and safety effects. A bartender can be personally liable for allowing a customer to exceed the prescribed dosage of alcohol, you know, drink an hour, etc. A bar manager can be vicariously liable for any harm even if they themselves did not serve the drinks, unless there are reasonable risk management processes in place and those processes are shown to be followed and enforced in the workplace. As far as we know, all poisons that form a part of daily life have exposure or dosage limits prescribed. Clear warnings and workplace health and safety policies and procedures except non-ionising radiation, EMR, radio frequency, call it what you will. None of this exists in the home, in the school or the workplace. Ask your school principal for their policies and procedures to protect your children from harm. They have none. They don't even adopt, well none for EMR. They don't even adopt the warnings on usage that are published by the manufacturers of Wi-Fi routers and laptops used in schools or the phones your children bring to school. They all have warnings about the safety. You know, a phone, keep it away from the body. A laptop, keep it away from the body. You don't have warnings unless there is a likelihood of harm. Ask yourself if ignoring manufacturers' warnings is negligent. Beyond manufacturers' warnings on usage, have ICNIP, APANZA, the FCC, industry and so on, intentionally avoided research into health. Health effects of longer term non-ionising radiation exposure. To be able to state no evidence of harm. No evidence of harm because we haven't done the research to show the evidence. If you don't do the research, you don't have the evidence. Is this intentionally negligent? You may also find on the APANZA website, APANZA actually recommend as a high priority research into the long-term exposure, especially for children. It hasn't been done. The Mobile and Wireless Forum 
is a powerful global organisation made up of the world's wireless industry. They've published a reassuring brochure on 5G. Wrong hand. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this was provided by Telstra, Australia's telecommunication company, to an ECSFR associate as evidence there are no effects from 5G. Now, as I said earlier, all of this will be available on our website. You can look at it yourself. The brochure quotes hundreds of research papers on millimetre waves and says, it concludes from these hundreds of papers, the only confirmed effects relate to heating of the skin. And that, according to the authors, the Soviet Union, China, and other Eastern European countries have used millimetre waves for the treatment of more than 30 diseases. A therapeutic good. Don't you find it odd that one can cure 30 diseases by millimetre waves that have no biological effects other than heating of the skin? We did. So ECSFR had the idea not to look for evidence of harm, but to look for evidence of benefit from millimetre waves, or 5G, 5G operating in the millimetre wave spectrum. All our countries have regulatory agencies that extensively test and prove new therapies before they're released to market, a therapeutic goods administration. Once they're released, the proof of the effects are conclusive. Here's one example of a millimetre wave therapeutic good we found researched in the US National Library of Medicine. As the Mobile and Wireless Forum tell us, the research on 5G millimetre waves is out there and so are the patents. Go looking for them yourself. The evidence from the US National Library of Medicine finds the following health benefits, health effects. An effect can be a benefit, an effect can be harm. From low power, 15 minute or so dose to 5G radio waves. One, sedative and analgesic effect. Two, stimulation of the immune system. Three, anti-inflammatory response. Four, change in cell growth and proliferation rates. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems to me to be more than simple effect on the skin. Here is an explanation of how one health effect works. Now, we're just gonna to go to the whiteboard and I'll do a little bit of a diagram. So, and yes, you're right, my, my strength is in solving complex problems, not art. Um, so tragically, this is the best I can do, but this is, just visualize this as your child, your grandchild, your son, your daughter, calling grandma on the birthday. And um, let's explore what uh, that brief phone call would entail in terms of the therapeutic effect. So quoting the um, article that we pulled down from the National Health website on uh, therapeutic good. And I'll read to you that, so 5G, just to recap, operates in the millimeter wave spectrum. The resulting, and this is all a quote, so the resulting millimeter wave signal is transmitted through the cutaneous nerve. So yes, there's an effect on skin, but it goes deeper than this, is transmitted through the cutaneous nerve, through the dorsal root ganglion, into the spinal cord, at the first synapse, so we're up in the brain here somewhere, at the first synapse of the spinal cord, there is a release of endogenous opioids. The release of endogenous opioids occurs in at least two other spots in the brain. So what we've just established is a therapeutic good using millimeter waves penetrates the skin, travels through the nervous system into the brain, resulting in a release of opioids. 
Wow. The subsequent release of, of endogenous opioids into the bloodstream. So now we're talking about an effect that goes even whole body. Spreads these chemicals throughout the body and certainly is adequate for explaining why pain relief can result from millimetre wave exposures. The involvement of endogenous opioids in millimetre wave therapy is verified by the fact that the beneficial effect of millimetre wave therapy is completely abolished upon the administration of nalap yeah, excuse me, naloxone, a general opioid inhibitor. Opioids are also known to have wide-ranging effects in various systems in the body, including the immune system. The transmission of the millimetre wave signal through the cutaneous nerve is verified, so this is the second verification, by the fact that the beneficial effect of millimetre wave therapy is completely abolished by severing the nerve leading to the spinal cord. So, what we've just heard, what you hear the authorities tell you is that there are effects on the skin. What the therapeutic goods tell you is that those effects on the skin are absorbed by the nervous system, transmitted by the nervous system to the brain, have effects of releasing chemicals in the brain, those chemicals go into the bloodstream, permeate the entire body. Effects on the immune system, effects on the inflammatory response, effects on um, cells, as we mentioned. This is pretty serious stuff. Now, that's a therapeutic good. That's the 15-minute call to grandma. But here we have, there's, there's your house and there's your 5G box and you're being exposed to it constantly. So we're not talking about a therapeutic good now, we're talking about an overexposure. You know, one sleeping tablet's fine, take the whole bottle, not fine. So, yeah, what can I say? This, this is, um, there's your proof of harm. All right, so back to the uh, desk. Now remember, the wireless industry tell us their shareholders, local authorities and regulators that the only confirmed effects relate to heating and effects on the skin and eyes. When reviewing the same evidence they rely on, it may be clear to a lawyer representing shareholders in a class action that this statement is possibly misleading. What is clear is that a very limited exposure to 5G millimetre waves is therapeutic. There are established health effects. I'll say it again. There are established health effects of 5G millimetre waves, and that means established biological effects. We all know 5G is being frantically rolled out around the world while we're being locked in our homes due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Telstra announced a $500 million investment of shareholder value into the rollout recently. When a 5G antenna is on your doorstep and you are being exposed to 5G millimetre waves almost continuously at home or at work, do the established health effects go from being therapeutic to being harmful. Remember, anything in moderation, too much of a good thing can kill you. Ask your local doctor about the overwhelming evidence of opioid addiction, immune system burnout, a compromised inflammatory response, and what happens when prolific cell growth is associated with mutations in DNA. I think that's called cancer. Also, let's look at the addictive effect of positive reinforcement. A 5G phone rings, you text, you search, you get an opioid hit or a fix each time. Check out the Skinner experiments or the DSM-4 
on addictions. It seems 5G is addictive by design. So let's wrap up joining the dots. All right, so let's wrap up by joining the dots. And I really recommend you refer this to your medical practitioner, your chief medical officer, because as I mentioned before, none of us in ECSFR are doctors or lawyers. We, um, we are professionals, uh, I'm an engineer, but we are not uh, medical doctors. But we do know how to read. Okay, so to sum up, we have a therapeutic good plus, and the therapeutic good we're seeing effects on the skin, effects on the um, nerves, effects on the brain, effects on the immune system, effects on uh, the inflammatory response, and effects on cells. Okay. In small doses, low power, therapeutic. Now, what we do is we add evidence of harm Oh, let's just back up to therapeutic good. Even though that is not evidence of harm, it is evidence of biological effect. It is evidence of health effect. So when somebody tells you that there is no evidence, question it. Now we look at the evidence of harm. A continuous experience of the biological effects is known to cause harm. Oh, and I forgot to mention blood. So, entire body really. So therapeutic good plus evidence of harm, which we'll call an overdose, equals proof of harm. We must have a moratorium on 5G until safe exposure levels are proven. Otherwise, we may all be at risk of becoming immune compromised opioid addicts. Welcome back. Well, here's part two, the parliamentary inquiry and the need for precaution. In part one, we demonstrated causal proof of harm from commercial exposure to 5G millimeter waves and called for a moratorium on 5G. Some of you may be aware, Australia has had a long-standing parliamentary inquiry into 5G going on. The link is also available on the website. ECSFR submission number 229 provided a risk overview and called for a detailed risk assessment and moratorium into the deployment of 5G. We didn't just talk about health, we raised many other risks that are associated with 5G. Risks to the national interest, risks to the public benefit. Our supplementary submission, which is also published, exposed some, shall we call it, mercenary science being relied upon by persons giving evidence to the inquiry. Of the significant number of 538 submissions made to date, the overwhelming majority are expressing concern with 5G. The overwhelming majority of submissions. Supported by evidence. This includes peak bodies, state and local authorities, scientists, doctors, mums and dads, lawyers. The only ones truly in favour are the wireless industry, and we are yet to see a business case that benefits anyone but them. The 5G inquiry is also not concluded, and there are no government recommendations that have been published as yet. Despite this, the Morrison government has gone ahead and committed $9 million of taxpayer money to assure the population 
5G is safe. Further press releases have been made about pushing ahead with 5G. I will in we'll include links at the end of this part too. Moreover, Telstra has announced a $500 million investment of shareholder value into urgently pushing out the rollout of 5G while we're all in our homes due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the session where ECSFR gave verbal evidence to the inquiry, the Honourable Mr. Ed Husick stated the following. Who are we supposed to rely upon when you've got this battle of experts? I'll say it again, this is a member of the inquiry, a member of parliament who's been privy to these submissions, said, who are we supposed to rely upon when you've got this battle of experts? A member of the parliament in the inquiry and recorded in Hansard has with this statement acknowledged there is genuine controversy over the science around the harm from non-ionising radiation and non-thermal power levels. Where there is genuine controversy, the precautionary approach, something encapsulated in environmental and other laws that are within state and local government jurisdiction must be applied. Again, where there is genuine controversy over the science, the precautionary approach or principle, something encapsulated in environmental and other laws that are a state and government jurisdiction must be applied. State, territory and local government should seriously consider their liability when continuing to approve any 5G or other tower or indeed any wireless installation until the cumulative radiation levels are known and the mid to long term effects of exposures on health and environment are understood. Thank you. Welcome back. This is part three of our four part expose. And this one is misleading and deceptive conduct. Government and public officials are constitutionally obliged to act in the public interest. If people rely on public officials who provide assurances that are knowingly or demonstrably untrue, they may be harmed. A further erosion of trust in government is inevitable. A misleading statement becomes far worse when the public official is a medical doctor, responsible for the health of the nation. Such people must be criminally prosecuted by civil servants who have a duty to protect the public interest. The AMA and APRA also have a duty to uphold trust in the medical profession. Similarly, company directors have a fiduciary duty not to mislead shareholders. Misleading conduct is at least addressed in the following. Section 18 of the Australian Consumer Law, Schedule 12 of the Competition and Consumer Act 2010, Section 12DA of the Australian Securities and Investment Commission Act 2001, States and Territories of Australia each have fair trading legislation, medical negligence, where the misleading information led to harm, and Section 307B of the New South Wales Crimes Act, which states, one, a person is guilty of an offence if the person gives information to another person and the person does so knowing that the information is false or misleading or omits any matter or thing without which the information is misleading. And so it goes on. If, say, a council worker was to rely on a statement by a PANSA, ACMA, the federal government, a medical doctor, chief medical officer, that 5G was safe, even if it's qualified, because let's go back to 1B2, omits any matter or thing without which the information is misleading. And that council worker relies on this in its planning consideration. And that statement was, and the towers go up and people get harmed. And that statement was proven to be misleading. Then the medical doctor or whoever made the statement could be prosecuted for a criminal offence, personally prosecuted. It's a crime. 
Given what we've covered in parts one and parts two, some might say any push for a 5G rollout is a significant risk to health, risk to health, and the safety of the public, of the workforce, and to shareholder value, should the risk be realised. The rollout is predicated on 5G being safe and not hazardous to people and the environment. Perhaps the wireless company boards of directors and public officials are relying on a written statement from Australia's Chief Medical Officer. Let's explore this statement in some detail. On the 23rd of January 2020, there was a press release that Prime Minister Scott Morrison had announced the recommendation of the promotion of the Chief Medical Officer to Secretary of the Federal Department of Health. The next day, on 24th of January 2020, the Chief Medical Officer did a press release on assuring the public that 5G is safe. This statement reads, and I'll read it out, I'd like to reassure the community that 5G technology is safe. There is no evidence telecommunication technologies such as 5G cause adverse health impacts. The position is supported by health authorities in Australia, such as the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency, PANSA, and around the world, such as the World Health Organization, the WHO. Mobile phone networks and other wireless telecommunications emit low-powered radio waves, also known as radio frequency electromagnetic energy. This is different to ionizing radiation with nuclear energy or use in medicine. The radio waves to which the general public is exposed from telecommunications are not hazardous to human health. So far we've heard 5G is safe, there's no evidence, and the radio waves, that's all radio waves, are not hazardous to human health. To ensure the public remains protected, a PANSA established limits for EME through a standard. This standard is designed to protect people from exposure to radio waves. Exposure to radio waves, we'll get to that. Limits are set well below the levels where there is evidence of some biological effects, such as tissue heating. Under the Australian Communications and Media Authority's regulatory framework, all telecommunications, including new, G, new 5G technology, have to comply with the exposure limits in the APANZA standard. We'll get to that. In order to further improve understanding about this issue, the Australian government recently announced an investment, an investment of your money, that's my words, sorry, of nine million over four years to assure the public of the safety of telecommunications networks including new 5G mobile networks. New initiatives under the enhanced EME program will include more targeted scientific research and public information to address community concerns, further information, etc., etc. So here we have unqualified statements from not only Australia's chief medical officer, but a medical doctor, that 5G is safe, not hazardous, and there is no evidence of adverse health impacts. The CMO, Chief Medical Officer, says that a panzer and who support his position. So let's look at what a panzer and who actually say, and let's look at the facts. The CMO says, quote, to ensure the public remains protected, a panzer established limits for EME through a standard. This standard is designed to protect people from exposure to radio waves. A Panzer and ACMA say in a joint statement in their frequently asked questions, and I quote, the exposure limits in the Panzer standard are only enforceable if they are referenced in other regulatory arrangements. Up next in part four, we'll explain part of the deception that there are no other regulatory arrangements. Therefore, the logical conclusion is that the exposure standards are not enforceable. Exposure standards. Therefore, the health risk and liability for harm posed by accumulation of radiation from multiple devices and exposure of the population over time is on industry 
and or state government or local councils to self-regulate health and environmental exposure. They do not. The Chief Medical Officer says, there is no evidence telecommunications technologies such as 5G cause adverse health impacts. Well, we're gonna give you a link uh, to ORSA and I think it's 5gemergency.org, which categorize by health impacts the different research papers, where you'll find thousands of papers, and it's not hard to find, that demonstrate communications technologies cause adverse health impacts. The 5G inquiry has plenty of evidence. Anyway, we've shown the basis for adverse health effects in part one, and there is an abundance of evidence provided and referenced in submissions to the parliamentary inquiry, as we showed in part two. But let's look at what a PANSA also say. The minutes of the Radiation Health and Safety Advisory Council from the 5th to the 6th of March, 2019, are an attachment to this part three. We refer you to section 7.2 of those minutes and note the people present at the meeting included numerous people from APANZA who gave a presentation on 5G. And we now quote APANZA from those minutes. Quote, any effects would therefore be restricted to the skin or eyes. End quote. Well, you remember from part one, it's far more than that. But anyway, this is an admission of effects and an admission of their anticipated location. Note that the so-called therapeutic effects on the nervous and immune system, cell growth, inflammatory response, and opioid release are not revealed by a panzer. Oh, quote number two. Not a lot of applied research has been conducted yet on the specific technology. End quote. Admission. Safety and risk cannot be assessed as there's inadequate research. You cannot opine on risk given inadequate data to make an opinion. The lack of research means you can neither exclude harm nor ensure safety. But the chief medical officer said, and I quote, 5G is safe. Here's quote number three from a panzer. A panzer still believes it is important to measure the radio frequency levels in the environment. A panzer's equipment currently doesn't measure radio waves at the high frequencies to be utilized by 5G, end quote there's an admission that radiation levels cannot be ensured to be within safe limits as they cannot be measured. Therefore, we have a breakdown in quality control. And finally, another quote from the minutes of that meeting, quote, making risk communication an important exercise, end quote. A panzer admit the responsibility to communicate the risk. Hang on, did I just say risk? It's inconceivable that a government regulator in this state of understanding can make any claims to a parliamentary inquiry or, I, or anyone else about the safety of 5G, only risk, and that the risk must be better understood given what is at stake. And what is at stake is the health of the nation. Further, I now quote from a Panzer's frequently asked questions. This is all on their website. I'm not making it up. The possibility of some risk cannot be ruled out, and for this reason, a panzer offers advice on how exposures can be significantly reduced. They offer advice, but remember earlier, nobody actually enforces exposures. If there are harmful effects, then it's, if there are harmful effects, okay, they're not ruling out that there may be harmful effects, then it's likely that the longer the exposure to RF, the greater any risk may be. Again, we come back to nobody measures exposure or regulates for it. Due to the lack of scientific evidence on mobile and cordless phone use by children, a panzer recommends, they're not suggesting, they're recommending that parents encourage their children to limit their exposure. If you're a parent and you've actually heard that, has the media told you that? No. Does the school tell you that? No. Does the uh, manufacturer of the mobile phone tell you that when you buy one? No. But here we have Australia's a panza recommending parents encourage their children to limit their exposure, to limit their risk due to the lack of scientific evidence. Our children are not guinea pigs. If a panza acknowledge risk and exposure risk, 
especially for children. How can 4G or 5G be safe? Surely to offer an assurance of safety is misleading. Let's quote the Chief Medical Officer again. Quote, I'd like to reassure the community that 5G technology is safe, end quote. A risk of harm, health effects, and inadequate research, measurement and risk communication does not equal safe. The Chief Medical Officer says, and I quote, the radio waves to which the general public is exposed from telecommunications are not hazardous to human health, end quote. A Panzer Technical Report 178.12 under Special Areas of Research states, and I quote, research on millimetre waves, including investigating the potential hazards, they've acknowledged potential hazards, and the adequacy of the current limits in the Australian RF standard. So again, a Panzer under Special Areas of Research state, research on millimetre waves, including investigating the potential hazards, and the adequacy of the current limits in the Australian RF standard. The World Health Organization, IARC, which is International Association on Research into Cancer, clarifies electromagnetic radio waves as a class 2B carcinogen. A recent letter to the European Journal of Cancer states, RF EMR, which now warrants an, upgraded, an upgrade to a class one carcinogen, that's a definite carcinogen. IARC reevaluation is urgent based on new evidence, including that from the US National Toxicology Program, showing clear evidence of RF EMR carcinogenesis, as well as the large increases in human exposure. Now, I don't know about you, but I would consider a potential or actual carcinogen, but let's just focus on potential because that's what the World Health Organization classification is, that a potential carcinogen is most certainly a hazard to human health. Again, the Chief Medical Officer said, not hazardous to human health. According to health.gov.au, Australia's Chief Medical Officer is the Australian member on the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the IARC, Governing Committee, and represents Australia at the World Health Assembly. Now, being on the IARC Governing Committee, the Chief Medical Officer was clearly a party to, or aware of, the Class 2B carcinogenic classification, and the recent call for an upgrade to the carcinogenic classification. Yet, in this capacity, the Chief Medical Officer assures us a potential carcinogen is, and I quote, not hazardous to human health. The Ford of the Apanza states, it is recognised that the standard does not operate in isolation from the legal framework within Australia, and goes on to state, in effect, such laws require relevant parties to continually assess and improve the safety and health impact of their activities. Moreover, a PANZA clearly state on their website that their advice is not to be relied upon. And if there are any concerns, the advice of a medical doctor is, a, is the authority. I think that's an admission by a PANZA that they are not a medical authority. And to see your doctor, who is a medical authority? The chief medical officer is a medical authority. If Australia's chief medical officer, a medical doctor and health authority, says 5G is safe and not hazardous, it follows that industry have been relieved of the need expressed in the Apans of Ford to assess and improve the safety and health impact of their activities. It's been done for them. The CMO says it's safe. On this basis, the industry perhaps pushed forward with the 5G rollout with any personal and criminal liability resting on the shoulders of the statement by the CMO. In saying 5G is safe and not hazardous, has Australia's CMO abrogated his duty of care as a medical doctor? As the absence of harm is because of the absence of evidence, not because of the evidence. If someone is proved to be harmed by EMR, 
Would there be a case for medical negligence? State chief medical officers should also take note because health is your jurisdiction. We'll cover that in part four. The APRA have requirements related to the conduct of medical doctors. Industry and the CMO often refer to a PANZA and the WHO. The CMO is a member of the IIRC. It is therefore clear the wireless industry and the CMO are acutely aware of a PANZA and WHO advice on hazard, effects, and risks from EMR. Risk does not equal safe. Also, because of you and your audit trails, your countless letters, your medical reports, and your submissions to the 5G inquiry, government, regulators, and industry are demonstrably aware of harm, risk of harm, and in many cases, your medical doctor's opinion of actual harm. Thanks to the 5G inquiry, we have much evidence on the public record. And we have found in case law from the UK and Canada that Hansard has been used as evidence in court. After being notified, anyone engaging in misleading or deceptive conduct does so knowingly. If that conduct is a contributing factor to harm, they may have personal and criminal liability for that harm. A recent ABC Four Corners episode called Pandemic, and we'll include the link, has many health experts and medical doctors critical of the Australian government's attitude toward health. From that Four Corners episode alone, one might conclude the government's policy is profit before health and don't manage risk of harm, but manage the body count. For a long time, doctors have been calling for immediate action. The World Health Organization was calling for immediate action. Australia didn't take that immediate action. Government has a constitutional legal obligation to protect the public, to act in the public interest, not to be the marketing department for the footy and 5G. Australia needs leadership. Many medical doctors have stood up publicly against the government policy on pandemic COVID-19. One can only hope the doctors start to rise up about precaution with a population saturated in non-ionising radiation and disease re related to EMR skyrocketing. We know EMR causes blood cancer. We can't yet say for sure that the saturation in non-ionising radiation is the cause, but we can quote the government's own estimates that blood cancers alone will cost the economy around $500 billion dollars in the next 15 years, not to mention the untold human suffering. With a federal government register of EMR health complaints managed by a PANZA and countless parents, children, workers, and for that matter, councils raising issues of concern over health, why does the CMO not seriously investigate? So where to from here? ECSFR will send this blog to the CMO and other regulatory authorities, just in case the CMO was not given all the facts of the matter. The CMO may well, as a matter of urgency, publicly retract the statement and officially notify all councils responsible for planning, all schools responsible for children, and all employees responsible for workers, and all wireless industry boards of directors who may presently be relying on the expert medical opinion of the CMO that 5G is safe and not hazardous. If there is no retraction, we may yet see a move toward a public or private criminal prosecution. We may see a complaint lodged with APRA or action by APRA. We're not lawyers. None of this information presented is legal advice. So if any of you watching this are lawyers and you would like to correct us or perhaps help us explore the concept of private criminal prosecutions or a submission to APRA, we would welcome you reaching out to info at ecsfr.com.au. If you're a national class action law firm, we're also interested in a chat. Thank you. Hello again. Well, this is our last part of the four part expose, part four, government jurisdiction and government failure. Part three was a bit heavy, but we'll move on. Okay. So over the past 12 months, ECSFR have been presenting arguments to state and federal government agencies, ministers and parliament. And here is the basis of our arguments, along with some government admissions of the shocking truth of the matter. The Australian constitution gives 
the Commonwealth jurisdiction as a health regulator only over health in areas of funding and quarantine. So all the Commonwealth government can do in relation to health is provide information and research. As is stated on the APANZA website and is clear from the afford of the APANZA standard, which is a standard in name only. In isolation, we can argue that the APANZA standard is actually an unenforceable guideline. I quote from the APANZA Act, quote, the object of this act is to protect the health and safety of people and to protect the environment from the harmful effects of radiation. One does not protect by informing, one protects by enforcement. Yet there are no compliance provisions in the APANS Act, no inspection, enforcement or penalty provisions in the APANS Act. One might suggest that constitutionally the object of the APANS Act and therefore a panzer is illegal. But we're not lawyers and we're seeking some constitutional advice on that. A panzer now admit in their FAQs, and I quote, the exposure limits in the APANZA standard are only enforceable if they are referenced in other regulatory arrangements, end quote. Yes, that's right, you heard it, are only enforceable if they are referenced in other regulatory arrangements. Clearly, the APANS Act is not an enforceable instrument of law. Industry, the courts and regulators would be well aware that one does not comply with a guideline and that a guideline is not legally enforceable. Yet we have legal precedents, such as Telstra versus Hornsby Council, that may well now be proven invalid. So what we have established is that since 2002, someone seems to have misled the courts, the government, the industry, and the media into believing a panzer are the final word in EMR health protection. That is 18 years of alleged deception and likely harm. And only now, when exposed, do we get an admission that, and I quote, the exposure limits in the APANZA standard are only enforceable if they are referenced in other regulatory arrangements, end quote. A panzer document TR182 provides further insight into what they call an oversight. Now, this TR182 was released in, I think, November 2019. So this insight into what they call an oversight is that there is no workplace health and safety protection for Australia's workers and no exposure protection for the general public, unless you're a Commonwealth employee. This is a significant regulatory failure or oversight, as a panzer call it. Yet, have you heard any of this in our allegedly captured media? Of course not. Why is that? Yet, you've heard the CMO assure us 5G is safe. You've heard the government dedicate 9 million to assuring us 5G is safe. Yet, you've not heard anything about what could impact the health of the entire nation. Even if 5G could be safe, there is nobody who is regulating compliance. And therefore, in the absence of any regulation of exposure, clearly 5G, indeed all radio frequency, is incapable of being proven safe. So what are the other regulatory arrangements for health and the environment? Let's now explore state, environmental and health law and federal communications law. The Australian constitution provides regulatory power to the Commonwealth on matters of communication. And ACMA is a national communications regulator. ACMA is not a health or environmental regulator. We understand that ACMA do have power to approve individual electronic communication devices. They also have the power to approve those devices against any requirements they deem necessary. And that includes the APANZA standard. They further have the power to allow industry to self-regulate when it comes to compliance with matters within ACMA's jurisdiction. So the bottom line is that ACMA approved a cell phone model, a Wi-Fi model, 
or a cell base station antenna as being compliant. This might be similar to America's FCC. ACMA do not approve the accumulated radiation levels, e.g. the environmental pollutants, in a home, workplace or classroom as compliant. ACMA are not an environmental pollutant regulator. ACMA do not approve the temporal dosage or accumulated exposure levels that are safe for the fetus, a baby, a child, an adult, or the nation's workers. ACMA are not a health regulator. State ministries of health are the health regulators, and they have seemingly neglected their role of protecting the public and the workforce. But we ask, are the state and territory governments negligent? Or were they misled into believing a panzer was the radiation health and environmental regulator, as is clearly spelled out in the object of the APANS Act. Nevertheless, the Ford of the APANSA standard clearly places the onus for legal compliance and managing health, safety and risk on industry. So what does this mean for your local authority, your council? Clearly a council should independently verify anything and everything we've presented and seek its own legal advice. We think at the very least, number one, council should investigate the workplace health and safety implications of a PANSA's oversight on the health of council staff. Council should investigate the implications of continuing to approve cell towers without understanding the population exposure, safe dosage and health risk. Byron Shire Council is to be congratulated on understanding this issue and putting in place a moratorium on 5G in Mullumbimby recently. To not place a shire-wide moratorium on 5G may still expose council to liability. You have to ask yourself as well, the very first council in Australia has placed a moratorium on 5G until essentially they can be assured that it's safe for the public. Have any of you heard anything about that in the mainstream media? Of course not. Have you heard it on the ABC? Of course not. Again, don't you think it's strange that we've got two major newsworthy items? Number one, the protection of our health nationally from non-ionizing radiation is what the government call an oversight and some might call it a deception. And the very first council in Australia places a moratorium on 5G and yet silence in the media. Anyway, point three. Council should consider that EMR is an environmental pollutant and states are constitutionally responsible for public health and planning laws and require consideration of public health and the application of precaution, which we cover in part two above. Finally, council should seek advice on the relevance of the Hornsby versus Telstra ruling in terms of the application of the APANSA standard within state jurisdiction and the relevance of a panzer to the states, as it seems a panzer have no regulatory jurisdiction over health and planning matters or environmental matters in states and territories. Thank you. Okay, so here we have, I don't know, Australia. And I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Um, now, as far as regulators go, so we have ACMA, I'll draw them here. Okay, and ACMA are responsible for telecommunications constitutionally over the whole country. So what we also have is a PANZA. And I'll put them out here because we'll talk about the relevance. And a PANZA issue, what we call the guideline, um, RP3, what they call the standard that tells you what they consider are safe levels. Now, if I have a mobile phone or some wireless device and I want to get it approved, get it operating, for that one device, that one model, um, let's draw a little phone here, it has to apply, that model has to comply with RP3 as part of ACMA's requirements. So, 
once that model's approved, you know, off you go, sell millions of them, whatever you need to do. And so all of those tens of millions of wireless devices in this country and all the towers and everything like that, their individual emissions have been approved by ACMA as being within the standard. And just as an aside, the wireless industry themselves have published many papers that vary in power consumption, but suggest that up to 51% of the world's power will be consumed by the wireless industry in coming years. So right there, 5G and the Internet of Things will negate all climate emission targets. 51% of up to 51% of global power consumption by one industry. Okay, now that climate risk, um, has that been disclosed, disclosed to shareholders? Who knows? But anyway, that's not what we're really talking about today. So we'll, um, we'll get back to regulation. So all of those millions of devices have been approved in isolation. But when you get, let's say we've got a classroom, there's our classroom, and in the classroom there's a Wi-Fi router, there's um, lots and lots of laptops, and all the kids that are sitting at those tables also have their mobile phones, you know, there's a Wi-Fi printer in the corner, and so on and so forth. Each of those individual devices are approved, but the entire classroom, with everything on and operating, has an accumulated effect of radiation. So we have to add, we have to consider each one of these and what they contribute to the overall picture of radiation in that classroom. So what we have is, you know, for that device, the radiation level might be down here, but when we add them all up, it might be here. Now, it may well be that the standard maximum of heating is still here. But we all know that there are biological effects below heating. The other thing we don't know, apart from the accumulation, is what's the exposure effect, the dosage. You know, I used before, one sleeping tablet's fine, a whole bottle, no good. So, you know, children in a classroom for six hours a day, every day of their school life, that's a decent dose. Go home, Wi-Fi at home, get on the mobile phone, how many hours a day are children being exposed to wireless radiation? And what is the health effect of that? Now, who's responsible for that? Who's responsible for the environmental pollutants, the cumulative effect? And who's responsible for the dosage? Well, that is all the various states and territories. Right? So each one of these states and territories has a Ministry of Health and constitutionally the states did not give up their regulatory power over health. And there's also the environmental laws. So when it comes to the dose, the exposure, the, um, I'll call it the level of pollutant, that regulatory responsibility rests with each individual state. APANZA has said their standard is ineffective unless there is other regulatory enforcement. Now each individual state and territory does have radiation protection legislation. The problem is it doesn't cover non-ionizing radiation except for maybe um, tanning booths and it's not enforced. So there's a huge hole in the regulatory system where no one other than federal employees are protected in workplace, in the workplace, where the population, there's a big question mark over what is a safe dosage, exposure, you know, um, cumulative effect of pollutants on the environment. None of those questions are answered. So many of you are uh, writing to your ministers, writing to different government officials in the Department of Education, Department of Health, various other places, and you're asking these questions, and your response is refer to a panza. Or rather, is that an abrogation of responsibility at a state level? 
Um, we've heard words called misfeasance in public office, malfeasance in public office, um, you know, negligence, criminal negligence. To refer to an agency that has no jurisdiction in your state when you have the jurisdiction, we ask the state governments, what are you doing? So is anyone actively pursuing this? Any of you governments? You know, congratulations to Victoria and West Australia for banning smartphones in high schools. In all schools. That's reducing the dosage. That's reducing the exposure, whether you know it or not. But other than that, you know, what's New South Wales doing? What's Queensland doing? Certainly the New South Wales Department of Education is well and truly on notice. And we're still waiting. So that's a question that we pose. You know, what are you doing to protect the health of the constituents in your state and territory? Thank you. Well, thank you all for uh, taking all of this in. I know it's a lot to take in and I'm sure you'll be talking to your doctors and lawyers and counsellors and friends and family and, and sharing the news. So just in conclusion, we've just presented four parts. Part one was conclusive proof of harm, where we, we, we obtained information from industry publicly available that shows biological effects and health effects. And we take that to its logical conclusion, take you through it, where we end up demonstrating proof of harm. Part two was the 5G parliamentary inquiry and the need for precaution. And we, we, we explain a little bit there and, and ultimately conclude with the reason the precautionary principle must be applied. Part three, we looked at misleading and deceptive conduct and we explored a bit of the law around that. Um, we also looked at a statement from Australia's chief medical officer that 5G was safe, 5G wasn't hazardous, there were no biological effects or health effects. And we presented evidence that would be contrary to those statements. You can make your own conclusions. And then the last part, we unpacked the panza. A little bit more of that and gave you a bit of more of an insight into the illusion of jurisdiction that's been created and really government failure and who's responsible for what. You know, you, for those of you that follow us regularly, you'd be aware that we have a crowdfund up. Um, that's really a bit of a war chest we're building for legal action. Any support you can give us would be greatly appreciated by contributing to that crowdfund. And what's our next step? Well, you know, we're still getting the information out there, crunching through all the data, we're providing things to you and sharing things with you so you can go off and do whatever you need to do. Um, as far as we're concerned, you know, we are exploring private prosecution of a perhaps a senior public official. We're also looking at uh, different options for class actions. And we'll come back to you on that in the near future. Thank you.